Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have produced for you a, uh, a pamphlet. Uh, I wish I could call it a sermon insert or an outline, but it's four pages. So it's a pamphlet uh, to help follow along with today's sermon. And I'd encourage you to do that. Take your notes on there. Um, I don't see any of our confirmation students in here today, but you could also turn that in as your sermon notes. And as we started last week, we heard Jesus with his opening words of the Sermon on the Mount. Those were the Beatitudes, where he spoke his blessing on his disciples, and in fact, conferred his blessing upon us, making us blessed by the very act of his speaking that blessing. We heard a, a little paraphrase of some of those in the song that we just heard. But the important thing about the Beatitudes is that you are blessed because Jesus says so. Not because whether or not you feel blessed, but because Jesus says you are blessed, you are blessed. He makes you blessed as a disciple of Jesus, as a Christ follower. And we also heard how Bible scholars think of the Beatitudes as kind of the gateway into the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes began talking about, blessed are they who, blessed are they who, those people over there are blessed. But by the end of the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are you, you are blessed. And from that point on, through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount until the end of chapter 7, Jesus speaks in the second person. He speaks, I to you. Jesus speaks directly to us. And in the very next section of the Sermon on the Mount that we had in our gospel lesson today, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression outside a church, but when you say that somebody is the salt of the earth, it's almost one of the highest compliments that you could pay to somebody. It's your way of saying that this is a person who really makes an impact on the world. This is a person who is essential. This is a person who makes the lives of the people around them better. And in that same way, Jesus, who's the, actually the one who first coined this expression, calls his disciples the church, the salt of the earth. What is it that salt does? Well, we already heard a little bit of that from Tom in the children's message. He talked about the way that salt adds flavor to food to make the food taste better. And so we can think about the way that Christianity and Christians are, are here to make the world a better place, to add more joy and more enjoyment because of the wonderful freedom that we have in Christ to, to live our lives for his glory and to enjoy the gifts of his creation. I know that a lot of times people kind of have this stereotype that Christians are sour and dour. We're not much fun to be around. We're the killjoy. We're not the life of the party. But if you think about the history of, of Christianity, nothing could have been further from the truth. Throughout the history of the church, it's the Christians are the ones who injected more flavor into life with music, with artwork, with architecture, with medicine and technology. Christianity and the church have always been on the forefront of taking those gifts that God has given us and using them in creative ways to make this world an even more remarkable place. Whereas the way of the world is to do the same old, same old, or just destroy the creation, Christians partner with God in using the creation to make the world beautiful. Salt also preserves meat from spoiling, and that's actually the first fill in the blank there. Salt preserves things. In the ancient world, they didn't have um, refrigeration, and uh, meat was hard to come by in the first place. It was expensive. Um, but if you had meat, you either needed to eat it right away or you needed to preserve it so it wouldn't go bad. And of course, the way that they would preserve it would be with salt and drying it out in the sun and, and preserving it that way. You may be familiar with maybe taking a little beef jerky on a car trip or a hike. Well, a lot of the meat that they ate in the ancient world was lamb jerky. <laughs> preserved meat with the salt. 
And the church is here to preserve the world. God has not destroyed this planet because of his faithful remnant, his people that preserve order and preserve the way of God in this world. Think about the way that God was going to totally start over uh, and, and totally wipe out humanity if it were not for Noah and his family that feared and walked with God, believing and trusting in him. God was almost going to do the same thing to the nation of Israel after they worship the golden calf and start over with Moses. But because of Moses, as God's man there in that place, praying and interceding and saying, Lord, don't destroy your people. God preserved the people of Israel. And he preserves this planet because of us, his people, the church that he loves. And in his mercy towards us, he extends mercy to the whole world. Salt is also a necessary nutrient for life. I know that uh, many of us have probably had a conversation with a doctor in which they said, all right, you got to cut back on your sodium. You're, you're eating too many salty snacks or putting it on your food too much. You need to cut back on that. I actually had the opposite experience. My doctor told me that I needed to have more sodium in my diet. I needed to eat more salt because I was drinking about a gallon and a half of water every day and just flushing everything right out of my system. And my doctor said, you need salt, you need sodium. Everybody needs salt in their body in order to, to live, in order for the chemical reactions that happen in our cells to take place and work properly. That's why if you grew up in the Midwest like I did, you would often put out these little blocks or pellets of salt in the backyard so that the deer would be able to have salt and make it through the winter and, and survive during the, the hardship of that time because they needed salt as one of those minimum nutrients in order to survive. And so also, the world needs the church because God does not convert people to the faith by just raining down Bibles from the sky that knock them on the head and, and then fall open to John 3.16. But God uses us. He uses his people to love and serve our neighbor, to pray for people. And as he gives us the opportunity to share that good news of the God who loves us and sent his son to die for our sins. And so just as salt is a needed nutrient in our life, so Christians are necessary in the lives of the unbelievers around us. Salt is so necessary that it might surprise you to discover that, that in ancient Rome, they often would pay their soldiers not in coin, but in an allowance of salt. Did you ever hear that before? The Latin word for salt is sal, S-A-L, sal. And the allowance of salt was called the salarium. And that's where we get our English word salary. Now, I'm very thankful that you don't pay me in salt. <laughs> but that is the way it was done in the ancient world. And then the soldiers, of course, could barter that for whatever other items they needed. But salt is so necessary. There's an interesting and necessary point we need to make about the salt here. Just as with the Beatitudes, Jesus didn't say, be merciful and you'll be blessed, but rather said, blessed are the merciful. And just as Jesus didn't say, be a peacemaker and you'll be blessed, but said the peacemakers are blessed, so also Jesus doesn't go around and say to his church, be salt, be salty. But Jesus says that we are salt. And once again, he confers that status on us by the very right and power of his word that creates. So rather than Jesus going to us and saying, be a little more salty, <laughs> rather than Jesus saying, come on, get with the program, start being salt instead of pepper, <laughs> Jesus makes us salt. He makes us that which preserves and gives flavor and gives nutrition and life to the world by his word, by his blessing, he accomplishes in us what he would have of us. And so the world needs the church just as we need salt. That's the next blank there. The world needs the church and you are the church. So the world needs you. The next part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. 
Notice how this statement is very similar to the salt of the earth. Jesus doesn't say, be light. He doesn't say, start a fire. He says, you are the light of the world. And this is extraordinary because many of us are familiar with those great I am statements that Jesus makes in John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. And he says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the, the source of light and life in the whole universe. He shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome Jesus Christ, the light of the world. But then Jesus turns right around. He looks at his church. He looks at his disciples and he says, you are the light of the world because the light of Christ burns in your heart. And we become a reflection of that light to the world around us. We have no light of our own, no inner light, but we are light because of the light of Christ, which we have by faith in him through the word that he spoke, through the death that he died and the life that he lives for us. I put a little scientific diagram there for you of the sun and the moon and the earth. If you were to go out for a hike on a night where there is a full moon, you would not need a flashlight because that moon shines so bright, giving that beautiful light that can guide your steps even in the dark. Does the moon produce any light of its own? No. There's no nuclear fission or fusion going on at the core of the moon. The moon is dead rock, white dust, gray rock. That is what the moon is. But the moon reflects the greater light of the sun. The sun shines on the moon and the moon bounces that light right back to the earth so that even in the midst of darkness, we can see the light of the sun because of the moon. And in a similar way, Jesus is our greater light. He is God's son and he is our son. <laughs> and he shines. And we are like the moon that reflects that light to the dark world around us. We ourselves are not the light, but we become light because of his light that shines on us. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Sometimes I ask people, how will your neighbors and friends know that you are a Christian? And usually the first thing I hear from Lutherans is by my example, by their moral example. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. The full answer is by our words and our deeds, but words without deeds will be a compromised witness. And we, our walk and our talk need to align. And so Jesus says, let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. Notice, not so that they see your good deeds and give you a thumbs up, a pat on the back, an attaboy, a medal, or even a cookie but so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Because again, when we look at the moon, we see the light of the sun. And when people look at us, they should see the light of Jesus. I know that um, this phrase, good works here, that Jesus speaks, is one that, that, that gets kind of tangled up and causes a lot of consternation for us in our whole understanding of grace and good works. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But what I want to point out is that these are not merely good works that Jesus is talking about here when we shine. Good works would use the Greek word agathos. Agathos means good. That's the one that the Apostle Paul usually uses. And agathos, it's like the name Agatha. That means a good woman, a good lady. But Jesus here uses the word kalos, which means beautiful or noble. Uh, it's where we get our word calligraphy from. Beautiful writing is literally what that means in Greek. Calligraphy is beautiful writing. And these are beautiful works. These are noble works. Not merely good works, but beautiful, noble things. 
that God's people do as we love and serve our neighbor and go about giving glory to God. I, this phrase is one that Jesus only uses in, in, in another place to talk about that beautiful work when the woman washed Jesus' feet with her hair and with perfume. And Jesus called that a beautiful work. And it's the same phrase that the Apostle Paul uses when he talks about the office of the Holy Ministry in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says, if anyone desires to aspire to the office of overseer or bishop, he desires a noble task, a beautiful work. And so God's people are not just do-gooders going around checking off, well, I did my good deed for the day. God's people are doing beautiful work noble things for the love of our neighbor and the glory of God. Jesus continues and, and he tries to help us understand what these beautiful, noble works look like. He, I put a picture there of the Ten Commandments, broken. And Jesus says that's not what he came to do. He says, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to throw away the Old Testament like old hat. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus came in order to fulfill the law so that by his perfect obedience to God's commandments, he would be able to be our perfect sacrifice on the cross to earn and win for us the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus doesn't say that now that it's fulfilled, you can just throw it away and just all you need now is, is just to read a few red letter verses from your New Testament and throw away all of the things about the holy godly life that are talked about in the Old Testament and in the letters of Paul. Jesus says, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a yoda, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. I want you to hold up your hand, your finger and your thumb, and make a little pincher here, a little crab claw, all right? And, and what I want you to do, not too hard, all right, but I want you to turn to the person next to you. And if there's not somebody next to you, then you can do this to yourself. I want you to give a little pinch. Did you feel that? Did you feel a little pressure? Did it maybe even hurt a little bit? As far as I know, that means that you're still here on the earth. The, you're still alive. The earth is still here. It hasn't passed away. And I hope that heaven hasn't passed away yet also. Jesus says not a yoda, not a dot will pass away from his law until heaven and earth have passed away. God's law is still in effect because God's law shows us how to love our neighbor. And God's law shows us how to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. What is a yoda? What is the dot that Jesus is talking about? I printed a couple Bible verses for you there in Greek and in Hebrew. And if you look at that first one that's in Greek from John chapter 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. That second word there, the fourth letter, it looks kind of like a cursive N. Can you see that? That's the Greek letter eta. And underneath that, where that arrow is pointing, there's a little tiny letter that looks like a cursive I. Do you see that? That is the Greek letter Yoda. Not a Jedi Knight, <laughs> and not mispronounced as Iota. I don't even want to hear that in here. But that's a Yoda. And Jesus says, that little tiny thing right there, not even that is going to pass away from his word until heaven and earth pass away. And what is the dot? Well, it's actually not a dot. It's more of a horn or a hook. It's korea, which is, means a little horned projection. And if you look on that Hebrew verse from the Ten Commandments that says you shall not murder, you'll notice how you have these skinny stems on a lot of the letters and then those blocky hooks and projections there. That's what Jesus is talking about. Those little things, those aren't going to pass away from God's law until heaven and earth pass away. And so the Old Testament and the letters of Paul that say don't murder, don't kill, don't steal, love your neighbor as yourself, don't hold a grudge against your children's generation, love the Lord your God, this is still in full effect. Not for us to earn our way into heaven. We don't do these good works in order to, so that we can be right with God. We're already right with God because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And so because we are right with God, we do these noble deeds, these beautiful works 
in order to love our neighbor. If you want to know how to love your spouse better, if you want to learn how to love your kids, your neighbor, your friends, your enemies, look no further than the Ten Commandments and they'll show you how to love the people that God has placed in your life. Paul says in Romans 13 that love is the fulfillment of the law. The law gives shape to our love and that's why Jesus says, do and teach the commandments. Don't throw away the Old Testament, but do and teach these commandments. Jesus says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And now it's at this point that it seems like everything that I've been saying about grace and good works up to this point has suddenly been derailed. And pastor is wrong. And don't you see, pastor, that we got to do good things in order to get into heaven? Because isn't that what Jesus is saying? That if we don't do enough good things so that our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, we won't get into heaven. Well, at first it might seem like that's what Jesus is saying, but we need to unpack that a little bit. Who are these scribes and Pharisees? Well, they were the really ultra-religious, holier-than-thou do-gooders of Jesus' day. And they were also the rule-makers who made all these extra rules about what you could and could not do as a follower of God, as a believer, in order that you wouldn't violate the Ten Commandments and all of these things. And they had rules about how much weight you could carry on a Saturday and how many uh, miles you could walk and, and what counted as work. For example, did you know that even to this day, one of the rules back then was that you couldn't light a fire on a Sabbath day. And so uh, the Orthodox Jews that live in New York City, they have what are called their Sabbath goyim. That means they're, they're Saturday Gentile who will come over and turn the lights on and off for them because flipping an electric switch would count as lighting a fire and that would be against the rules and that would make God angry, don't you know? So these are the holier-than-thou do-gooders that make all the rules. And they looked down their nose at everybody else that didn't keep their rules and said, you're not good enough, you're not holy enough, you're not like me, you're not going to get into heaven. And Jesus says, you need to be holier than them in order to get in. You know what the problem is? Rule makers are also rule breakers. <laughs> Because all of us are sinners. No matter how many rules we make, we will still find rules to break. <coughs> and we'll never be able to do enough good to get in right with God. That's why Jesus came. He fulfilled the law that we could not keep perfectly. Again, so he could be our perfect sacrifice. And the righteousness that we have is from Christ. He was perfectly righteous, and he gives that freely and fully in something the Bible calls justification. And justification means to be made righteous, to be made right with God. Justified, it's just as if I'd never sinned. And so through justification, by grace through faith, in the wonderful words and works of Jesus, we have full righteousness. A righteousness that is so much greater than what all the do-gooders and rule-makers could ever have because it's the righteousness that Jesus gives to his people and gives to us. And in fact, the scriptures themselves say that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. If you believe in Jesus, your righteousness goes from the heavens to the earth. If you do not believe in Jesus, Nothing you have will ever be good enough. It's like the parable of the, Samar of the tax collector and the Pharisee. Jesus talked about a, a, a tax collector who was groveling on the floor, praying to God and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then there was a Pharisee there who said, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other men. I tithe twice a day. <laughs> And I'm not like this miserable tax collector. And Jesus said, which of them went home justified? Which of them went home righteous? And he said it was that tax collector groveling on the floor, a liar and a cheat, who knew that he was a liar and a cheat and cried out to God for mercy 
and righteousness. Remember the beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And the only reason our righteousness exceeds that of the do-gooders is because of the righteousness that Christ has given to us. At this point, sometimes our critics will say, well, you Lutherans, if you're depending on Jesus and his righteousness and what he did in order to get into heaven, then what's the point of your good works? You could just lie, cheat, and steal. You could just be into old whiskey, fast cars, and young women, and, and you, you, you think you'll still get in. You could live a wretched life. That's not what Jesus is saying. You know, all these people that think that their good works are going to get into heaven, they're putting the cart before the horse. If you think about it, if you put the cart in front of the horse, are you ever going to get anywhere? No. The horse has to pull the cart. And God's grace is the horse. And our good deeds are the cart. And the works that God has given us to do, these beautiful, noble deeds, they follow God's grace. We don't have grace because of the works. We do the works because we already have God's grace. And they are the fruit of our faith. They are the spontaneous overflow of our love and our gratitude for the grace that God has given to us and the righteousness that Jesus has given to us. Remember, we do these things not because we're trying to get right with God, but we're already right with God because Jesus says you are blessed. Jesus says you are salt. Jesus says you are light. And if Jesus says it, he can't be wrong. And so as salt of the earth, we can't help but be salty. As blessed people, we cannot help but bless others. And as light of the world, we cannot help but shine. Because that is who Jesus has made us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen.